I will have a uh, we will have a brief discussion about the evaluation of the swallowing disorders in the children. Now, basically, this is the domain where when I started my residency, I was uh, got introduced to it because we used to have a lot of children with the structural airway anomalies and the neurological issues, the neurodevelopmental issues, where we used to find these children with these difficulties in the swallowing. And, uh, broadly, the term uh, swallowing dysfunction used to be attributed to that. But when actually I started closely looking at these children and started learning more and more, we found that there are many nuances of this, what we really need to look at. Because in normal way, we pediatric surgeons, we are basically trained to do the contrast swallow, mainly to look at the esophageal phase and the gastroesophageal junction and the G junction, I mean the stomach and the gastric clearance as a follow through. But the oral phase of the swallowing and oropharyngeal phase, right, there are also certain nuances which we really need to look at. Now, when we talk about the evaluation of the swallowing disorders in children, there are few facets of that. One is the history taking and a detailed patient history taking, where we find out that how exactly is the swallowing behavior or the response to the offering of the food to the child and then when we do the swallowing assessment either we can do a radiological assessment or we can do an endoscopic assessment. Now to start with, sorry where is it going? My apologies. Now to start with, I will talk about the video fluoroscopic swallow study, which is a radiological assessment of the swallow. Now video fluoroscopic swallow study basically looks at the oropharyngeal phase of the swallow. But as I discussed before, the prerequisites are history taking, which is very important, like the type of food which the parents are more comfortable to the offer to the child. Some parents will come and tell that he will gulp the solid food well. Some will come and tell that no, he tries to take most of the purees and the semi-solid kind of stuff well. Some will tell that he takes the, he or she takes the liquid food very well, but the child doesn't take any semi-solid food which completely stays as a bolus in the mouth and after some time the child pukes it out. Pre-feeding behavior. Basically, whenever the food is offered to the child and if the child is having any aversion to the food or when the child takes the food inside the mouth, really depends upon what kind of taste the child wants. Because if you are planning to do a swallow study and if you are offering a food which the child really doesn't like or the taste does, the child doesn't like, the swallow study will never be a successful study. So that is the reason it is important to know the pre-feeding behavior of the child and what kind of food actually child tries to take. So once the child takes the food inside the mouth, the important questions to the ask to the parents is that whether the child continues to uproll the tongue and take the food inside or just takes the tongue out and throws it out. So that actually defines that whether there is a tongue thirst, thirst which is uh, present from the very beginning of the feeding and that tells the central neuro neuraxial axis integrity that gives a good indication of the central neuraxial activity. And of course some coughing or choking or the child visits the hospital frequently for recurrent lower respiratory tract infections. These are, this can give us the idea about whether there is any uh, issue with the aspiration and things like that. Failure to thrive. Failure to thrive is an important uh, history taking that recurrent uh, hospital admissions or poor weight gain. All these things can indicate that you might not be able to do a good video microscopic swallow study and ultimately you might have to offer a gastrostomy and fundoplication to the child. And the feeding chart, before we do the video fluoroscopic swallow study, we need to see at least a week of feeding chart what, type, what the child is taking 
and what kind of food child is mostly taking and if there is any post feeding vomiting or choking or during the feeding if there is child is throwing out the certain kind of foods the fudio fluoroscopic swallow study is important when we are doing it we need to know that what parents are offering at home are they bottle feeding the child are they using the palada or are they using sometimes what is called small uh, tube like things to slowly give uh, drop by drop so that the child cannot take the boluses that is important because if we do not use the same thing we might not be able to allow the child to gulp because first of all it will be an strange environment for the child many a times they are not as cooperative as they are at home so to keep the environment as familiar as possible for them is important now per se video fluoroscopic swallow study is preferably done in the sitting position and if we do not have such arrangements what we do is we try to keep the child mostly in the reclined position or sometimes use multiple pillows and support so that we can make it as uh, sitting as possible it is important to involve the parents during the feeding because uh, if the child refuses to take feed from the uh, the doctor then in that time it is important that the parents try to feed them and most of the time we are successful with this when we are doing this study we should ask the parents to get the food from home not that food we prepare at the hospital because those are the foods the child is taking at home and it's easy to mix with the contrast and it is the child recognizes the food better and takes it from the very beginning we need to look at the tongue movement the up rolling of the tongue that uh, that is squeezing the tongue to the so the heart palate is something which tells us that the child's central neuroaxial axis is good so the oral phase of the swallowing is good and each phase of the swallowing needs to be uh, observed which i'll discuss a little later always it is important to inform the pediatric emergency team that in case of any event of aspiration which is uh, sometimes may be significant and we need the emergency backup usually the pediatric neurologist we who is seeing the child if it is a child who is having a neurodevelopmental issue we talk to them because sometimes we have the neurological disease which are progressive and those cases whatever the outcome is maybe the progressive disease the child might not do well so from the very beginning it is important to Uh, know about the neurological status of the child now this domain per se was a domain of the speech language pathologist and uh, we as a pediatric surgeon during our residency we got involved because we were seeing many patients like that and slowly started doing these studies what we use is basically a water soluble contrast uh, medium and always we avoid barium although we continue to use the word barium swallow barium swallow many areas better to avoid barium because in any case of aspiration we will have trouble and then uh, the pneumonitis and stuff are very severe with the barium preferably to use a dilution of the 1 is to 5 that is the one part of the contrast medium and the fifth part of the i mean uh, fifth part of the uh, what should i say fifth part of the the food and the one part of the contrast medium our uh, dilution sometimes required to be little more one is to four but uh, preferably to keep it at that more than that sometimes in, if we have aspiration and stuff then we are having trouble now this picture depicts the phases of swallowing what we actually see during the oropharyngeal uh, assessment of the video fluoroscopic swallow study we can see that the picture a the food bolus is basically placed on the tongue that is to allow the tongue to squeeze against the soft palate and to push it back into the posterior one third of the tongue so now if we are doing a study where we are actually giving it with the syringe and we push the contrast material very fast and actually it hits the posterior wall of the pharynx in that case we might have aspiration and which might not be there actually for the child so we might have a false positive aspiration during the giving the food bolus i had seen one baby where 
the baby had a simple GER, but during the study of uh, this video fluoroscopic swallow study, the food was given was a very liquid contrast material mixed with the milk and that was pushed very fast and the child actually had a fast aspiration. So it is very important to give the first swallows very patiently over the tongue and allow the child to uproll the tongue, squeeze it against the soft palate and then push it back towards the posterior one third of the tongue which is what we are seeing in the picture B. Basically, it is squeezing against the soft palate and then pushing it into the posterior one third. Then as the child swallows, then uh, it passes through the oropharynx and the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes and the food boluses are slowly propelled into the esophagus and this is what we are seeing the esophageal phase of the swallowing. Now, if we have given the boluses correctly, we can have certain small nuances what we can pick up. Suppose if you have given the child with the, the bolus which during the oral preparatory phase and the child is not able to generate, push it into the posterior one third of the tongue. Then we know that there is an issue with the lip closure and the tongue thirst and the tongue control is not very good. Sometimes we find in the neurodevelopmentally impaired children, they have continuous twitching of the tongue. In those cases, we are having the difficulties in that. When the food has gone into the pharyngeal area, that is the oropharynx or the upper uh, or the hypopharynx area, and again, if the child is actually bringing it back, then, then the velopharyngeal closure is not good and there is a oropharyngeal incoordination for the child. Sometimes the child aspirates during the study, then we know that the epiglottis actually does not invert and close the airway during the study or the child might have something called a nasal block or the post nasal drift for which continues to have mouth breathing. So if you ha want to have any further details, this is a very good article in the Journal of Child Neurology which discusses about the dysphagia in the children and these nuances of the swallow study. As I was telling that if we are not doing the study properly, what we can have a problem. This is basically is a domain of the speech language pathologist. We as a pediatric surgeon need to know when a swallow study has been done, whether it has been done correctly or the findings what we are getting is not right because the study is not done correctly. If you look at this picture, this child has been placed quite in the neck hyperextended. Something for a normal person also, it is difficult to gulp the food if we extend the head like that and then try to feed somebody. Now, once you do that and then try to push the food with a syringe and with an excessive force, what you can see is you can have the food bolus coming over the superior surface of the dorsal surface of the tongue, but then some of it goes and hits the posterior pharyngeal wall and then actually can become an aspiration. If this is missed, then when you are actually doing the study, now you have a reflux. You really do not know whether this aspiration is because of the reflux or is because of the wrongly done study. So, doing, during the oropharyngeal phase, it is very important to keep the neck, neck neutral and then give the fluid boluses slowly. Give the small amount of bolus first, see if the child is able to cope and then increase the volume of the feed slowly. And also when we are doing the video fluoroscopic swallow study, it is important to use the different consistency of the food. To start with, we can start with some liquid food or we can ask the parents what is the order of feeding the child is taking at home. Is the child taking more of semi-solids and less of liquid? or less of liquid and I mean more of liquids and less of semi-solids. Whatever consistency of the food the child is preferring at home, st start your study with that first. So that you will have a better picture of the oral and oropharyngeal coordination and then slowly change the consistency of the food. Now, it is also important that when we are doing this study, we label them, label them properly. When we are using the semi-solid, there should be something like an 
S. When you are using the liquid, there should be something like liquid which is placed on the uh, this thing, uh, your uh, X-ray plate, so that we are able to the, later on when we are evaluating the study, we know that what consistency of the food, food the child is preferring better. Now, another part of the uh, swallow assessment in the children is what is called fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of the swallow. It is fees. Majority of the time it is done by our ENT colleagues. What they do is basically they take a 3 French or 2.5 French fiber optic endoscope, pass it through the nose with adequately lubricated. The parents usually hold the child and then some coloring substance can be given as a food bolus into the mouth. And as it passes through the pharynx and the larynx area, that time we can actually have a look that how the child is handling the pharyngeal phase of the swallow. This study per se do not evaluate the oral or the oropharyngeal phase, mostly looks at the laryngopharyngeal coordination of the child. So, advantages wise, it is an awake uh, evaluation, which is same as the video fluoroscopic swallow study, which that is also an awake evaluation. We can have a direct visualization of the laryngeal structures, but uh, there is no radiation involved and you can use minimal amount of food bolus. You do not have to use a very large food bolus to assess the pharyngolaryngeal coordination. And since you are using a very, mon very minimum amount of food bolus, then the aspiration is also not that significant. And during the study, before the pre-study on pre-feed only, you can assess that how the child is handling the secretions inside the larynx, inside the pharynx and the laryngeal sensations when your endoscope starts, whether the epiglottis inverts and closes the larynx. But also, as I told that it does not evaluate the oral phase and the nuances of the tongue movement and the lip closure and the vallecular clo closure, all these things we are not able to evaluate. And if the child is very apprehensive and crying a lot, sometimes we cannot see anything. There might be complete whiteout of the scope. Some children, if they have already a allergic rhinitis or active rhinitis or some chronic sinusitis kind of picture, the moment the scope is put inside the nose, they really do not tolerate it. So it becomes very difficult to do the study. Now this is the part that video fluoroscopic swallow study or the piece is primarily was not or maybe till now is not being done as by the pediatric surgeons. So the, I thought that let us talk about something about the contrast swallow also because most of the time we do the swallow and we also look at the esophageal uh, phase of the swallow which something is not the domain of the ENT or the, the swallow the speech language pathologist. Now, what we do during the contrast esophagram is basically we are looking at the anatomy of the esophagus. That is, when the food is passing through the esophagus, whether the esophagus dis distance. A uh, distensible esophagus is normal. That is, the primary and the secondary uh, contractions of the peristalsis of the esophagus is quite well preserved. So, the esophagus distends and the food passes and there is no hold up. And we do not see any tertiary contractions or the yo yo movement in the esophagus, then we know that there is no intraesophageal reflux or the laryngopharyngeal reflux, and all those things are very less. We also look at the lower esophageal sphincter relaxations during the study, and as we know, the nacalicia cardia and all, we do not have the enough relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And the proper leveling of the swallow phases was, uh, as I was telling before also, that during the esophagus, whether we are finding any tertiary contractions and all, we need to label this immediately after the study. Because later on, when we try to look at this, it becomes sometimes difficult to assess whether the things happen during the swallow or during the reflux. Now, uh, it has been criticized that is contrast swallow has been sometimes criticized for the monitoring of the gastroesophageal reflux that it is having a poor sensitivity compared to the 24 hour ambulatory pH monitoring. But it is still effective for us as surgeons because it gives us a good anatomical picture of the esophagus, whether the esophagus distends well, whether there is any diverticula, whether there is any tertiary contractions of the esophagus or because if you have an intraesophageal reflux at the tertiary contractions 
or the yo-yo movement. Uh, concept something what, what some what we talked about now is the laryngopharyngeal reflux. That is the extraesophageal manifestations of the gastroesophageal reflux, where the food particles not only comes as a reflux set, the child present uh, mostly presents with chronic sinusitis or a brassy cough, horse cough, or sometimes a strider. Those are the children. The juries are still out about the effective management of the disease because usually they have seen that if they respond well to the proton pump inhibitor they might respond well to the fundoplication if necessary. However, if they do not respond to the proton, proton pump inhibitor, the result of the fundoplications may not be optimum. But it has also been seen, there are a few papers which are coming up, that if you add up a prokinetic with the proton pump inhibitor, usually laryngopharyngeal reflux does well with that. And whenever we are doing the study for the gastroesophageal reflux, we should fill up the stomach. Sometimes it is very difficult to feed the children in a large amount during the study, even the children who are neurologically completely intact and everything fine because unless and until we have a good intragastric volume, we may not be able to demonstrate the reflux. Now, to fill up the stomach, sometimes we put an NG and we fill up the stomach. It is important to ask the parents what is the amount of food usually the child takes at a stretch. Suppose if takes 60 ml or 40 ml or 50 ml, start the study with filling up the stomach with the 40 percent or the 50 percent of the volume and see how the child reacts to that because you will be having a tube sitting across the lower esophageal, esophageal sphincter or the G junction. Now in that case, there will be a persistent esophageal relaxation that is the gastroesophageal junction will be opened up and you will have some degree of reflux happening. So if you fill up the stomach slowly and then take out the tube and do the study in the different postures, if the child is crying and lying down flat, even that could be a normal, I mean that could be normal for the child to have some degree of uh, reflux. So that time we need to look at the gastroesophageal junction, whether it is open or whether it is quite patent, I mean quite tight. So that will give us some idea and also that time as the child calms down and becomes comfortable during the procedure, try to repeat the study in the sitting posture, recumbent posture and then in the lying down posture. So that we will have a fair idea how the child is actually handling the gastric volume. So this study during the uh, contrast swallow for the gastroesophageal reflux is not a very good study because we are already having a reflux and the NG tube is sitting across the GE junction and going inside the stomach. So something which is not good because if you do not take out the NG tube during the study, whatever reflux you get at this moment may not be the uh, actual amount degree of reflux. It may not be the grades of the reflux you are looking at. It might be a lower grade of reflux and then might respond well to your prokinetic and the PPI management. So always before starting the study, once you have filled up the study, it filled up the stomach, it is important to take out the tube and do the study. Now in this study, we can see the stomach is filled up and we are looking at the reflux. What is important to look at it? is the gastroesophageal junction. We are not only having a dilated lower esophagus, which is also a telltale sign of a significant reflux, also we have a completely open or patent gastroesophageal junction. This is very common when we look at the primary gastroesophageal reflux. These are the children where we have to start the reflux management ag aggressively. The pharmacology is a bridge to the management of the gastroesophageal reflux, primarily the recumbent feeding and the propped up feeding and the chicken feed and if it is a very small child burping after feeding, if it is an older child frequent small feeds instead of giving a large volume of feed is important. So that is the reason when we start the study we do not fill up the stomach fully with the volume what the child is getting at home. 
we will have a fair idea that whether the child is able to handle a smaller amount of bolus without any reflux. Once the child comes down, then you fill up the stomach during the study and take off the NG tube. Whereas, if we look at what is called secondary reflux, you can see here the child is having significant reflux, almost grade 4 reflux, but the gastroesophageal junction is quite tight, it is competent. So, if you have such gastroesophageal junction in a child with history of frequent vomiting or frequent uh, fauceting kind of things, then you will probably think before starting your anti-reflux management about the alternative cause. And also during this phase, you can see there is lot of contrast accumulation at the pylorus. This child uh, virtually later on to found out, uh, later on was found out to have a infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The study was done outside, not by uh, us. So, this is one good thing to know about the secondary GER is that in a secondary GER, you might not have a very patent or opened up GE junction, whereas in the primary reflux, you will have that. So, this is important to look at during the contrast esophagogram or the contrast swallow. That was a very short presentation. I am still indebted to Dr. Sanjay Rao, who is my teacher, who actually introduced me to the swallow study and then Robert sir allowed me to continue with that and really pick up the nuances. And I was once fortunate to meet Dr. Claire Miller, who is the, the program director for the speech and swallow in the Cincinnati Children's Hospital during my residency. And during that time, we realized that there are so many nuances in the speech and uh, this one swallow study. Now, one important fact about the video fluoroscopic swallow study is that ultimately if the child if continues to have the LRTI or the failure to thrive or poor response to the medical management, might land up in a gastrostomy or and or fundoplication gastrostomy in the presence of reflux. But if we pick up those nuances of the oropharyngeal or the oral phase difficulties for the child, we can actually prognosticate that whether this child will come out of the gastrostomy, will the swallow improve for the child, will the referring to the speech language or the swallow therapist will improve the swallow for the child and can we really tell this to the parents. So, this is the basically the swallowing disorder of the children requires the involvement of the surgeons, involvement of the neurologist to look at the neurological outcome from where the child is suffering, if the child is neuro, having neurodevelopmental issues and also the swallow therapist. And with the gastrostomy fundoplication, definitely if the child's weight improve, the child's failure to thrive can be attenuated, then going forward many of these children do come out of the gastrostomies, I properly refer to a speech and swallow therapist. Thank you. I will take the any queries from the student? Yes. Yeah. Um, Shonak, uh, uh, heartfelt congratulations. You've done a brilliant job. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I joined a little late because of technical glitches. My system system simply crashed. I had to reboot it. But anyway, I will talk to. I will give you an introduction after the whole class is over. But anyway, uh, you have done. A, uh, you have indeed done a great job and. Uh, uh, Sanjay and Robert must really be proud of you, the way you've been groomed into. Thank you very much. A few simple uh, questions. One, most important, you made the point very, very clear that all swallowing disorders can't be just grouped into one and uh, a gas, simply a gastrostomy or fundoplication or just waiting, waiting, waiting. Both of them are not the right option, but to evaluate it thoroughly. It has come from yes, a long, sir. long way from my MCH days because my MCH days, the same thing used to be emphasized in different words by my teachers. When they used to say, do a barium swallow or a feeding study, all we had to do was a barium. We had only a darkroom fluoroscopy. We hardly had a, a CM those days. And uh, it was very clearly told that uh, you watch the child as the child is swallowing. You give the feed yourself. You just make sure that the child is swallowing. And that time, the, even though darkroom fluoroscopy is not there, at least intermittently take pictures, wait for the stomach to fill up, see the gastric outlet, see whether the reflux comes back, 
see the gastric emptying time, all these things they only make it. But that is, there is a lot of emphasis on subjective matters and a lot of technical gaps. But I think what you have made is brilliant because you emphasized on the history, which is very, very crucial to observation of the child as the child is following. Three, most important is uh, how the child normally is used to feeds. I mean, what the quantity of feeds, the quality of feeds, the uh, posture of feeding, brilliant. Then also told a lot of about the practical aspects of doing it and interpretation. It is brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, just you. two questions before we pass it on to the rest before I come back to you. One is, uh, yes, sir. I've uh, seen uh, fees being talked about by the team which keeps, uh, the airway team which keeps coming to Manipal. A couple of times I've seen it. It is very interesting. But somehow when I saw the videos and I, when I saw it actually being done on a patient, it is very unpleasant in the sense you put uh, the, the endoscope through the nose and you can allow the child to swallow. It is grossly unphysiological, even though theoretically it's normal. Like the way you say, do an MCU with the physiological circumstances. It is not possible. I mean, what yes. is your take or have you, how often are you doing this fees? Fees, honestly, I have been involved with when during my residency. But what I have realized, when you have put the laryngoscope through your nose and you are looking at the vallecula, you are looking at the uh, epiglottis, you are looking at the posterior glottis, if you find it very inflamed and if you find there is already pulling of secretions, okay, you know that there is an element of laryngopharyngeal reflux happening and oh, probably okay. the child is having a persistent uh, this one, uh, uh, what should I say, persistent uh, inflammation of the posterior glottis and the uh, upper airway and the upper oropharyngeal airway. So if you find the child basically not even taking the small boluses of the feet during that time, okay. okay. usually fees is good to do in a small baby. Mm -hmm. I found that the older the child, the very less is the cooperation. Whereas okay. the younger baby, the mother can hold and then we can mm -hmm. actually start the appropriate management. And if the child is still able to handle with all those inflammation, these boluses, very small amount of bolus, and not aspirating during the study, then we know that with an appropriate management of the reflux, that is the okay. proton pulp inhibitor and the prokinetics, the child will probably improve significantly. Okay. But I agree, peace is sometimes is not possible because if there is a complete whiteout, you might need the time when the child has actually aspirated. Okay. So fees alone without VFSS is not recommended. Okay. They are okay. both probably complementary to each other. Okay. Uh, two other questions. One, uh, there's a completely different uh, uh, types of patients which we see in a uh, 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 public hospital and a private hospital. Since I see both of them, yes, the types of cases that we see in uh, private hospitals are very different. Where basically many times the parents are complaining that the child is spitting, not eating well, and uh, the typically like the mother, kuch bhi nahi kata hai mera bachcha, hamesha sab ulti karta hai, and the child is already overweight. It's obvious that the child is not. Uh, it's a question of feeding or the greed of the mother, the, either the feed or the greed of the mother. On yes. the other hand, we see a completely different set of picture in the uh, public institutes where there's a lot of subtle things. For example, pseudobulbar palsies, bulbar palsies. Uh, neurological impairment, um, GER, faulty feeding techniques, and uh, holding. I mean, uh, uh, how do you uh, put a simple algorithm about which patients do you think requires? Because the way you described is fantastic about how to go about how to get the things done. But practically, it is so difficult to say to get every baby to that. So, where are the conditions where you will see as a thumb rule that okay, these are the patients who require further evaluation, sir. So basically, the when we have a so, child who uh, is just a minute, referred, meeting might end anytime soon. If it ends, we'll re-log in through the same link. This is particularly for the newcomers, Shonak and uh, the rest of them. I think somebody from Chennai is also there. Whoever is there, in case we in case the meeting abruptly ends, don't hesitate. Come back again. We'll restart. Okay, come back. So the yes, way sure. we see these children, basically, they don't land up in our OPD de novo to decide that whether they require the swallow study. Majority of the time we get them referred from the uh, pediatric neurology uh, referral where they feel that the child needs a swallow study. So then we need to talk to them and find out that what is the clinical implications they are looking at. Are they looking at a static disease or are they looking at a progressive disease 
or do they expect this disease to improve over a period of time? Then the children with the, any neurodevelopmental issue, if they have those history of not whenever the food is being given, like the history taking, that whenever the food is given, give, being given, the child pushes out the food with the tongue, doesn't take it, completely keeps the food in the mouth and sometimes is having a coughing and choking. Okay. These are the children where we would feel that, yes, there is a requirement of the swallow study. And of course, if we have the histories like the baby is arching, like the uh, Sandifer syndrome for the, the reflux, or the child is having a poor weight gain, or persistent coughing immediately after feed, or after sometimes after feed, or failure to thrive, these are the children we will look at doing this study. But what I emphasize is that just doing a study and telling that the child is not taking, and we will do a fundoplication gastrostomy, it is easier for us to tell. But for the parents, the question is, will my child ever come out of the gastrostomy? That is the common question I face. So if we have that question, then we have to look at the neurological disease, which our neurology colleagues will let us know. And during the phase of the study, we really need to know that whether the child is having just a mere weakness of swallow or just not able to coordinate. To be very simplified, to go this way. If the child is not able to coordinate, is pulling continuously, and is having persistent aspirations like that, then very unlikely this child will come out. We can refer to a speech swallow therapist and see the how child improves. But if the child is having just weakness, then with some amount of physiotherapy and changes in the feed, feed consistency and feed volume over a period of time, and as the child grows on the gastrostomy, feed becomes more stronger, probably there might be some hope for the child to come out of the gastrostomy. But however, we need to talk to the parents, it's going to be a long haul. So, an obese child where the parents are telling that he's not feeding uh, and things, I'm probably not going to do the swallow study. I'll probably look at the management of the weight issues and other stuff like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the simplest thing I tell the uh, such parents, affluent parents, if you know that obviously there's a feeding problem, I just tell them, give me a week's time and after which I will test for the for one week, don't force the child. Don't don't even if the child says stop, stop. Gain the okay. child's confidence that you're not going to overfeed the baby. I simply tell, don't ever simply listen to the baby. Even if your baby loses weight, don't worry, nothing will happen. Just listen to the baby. Because generally what happens is the child knows that the mother is going to stuff the child. So even before the child gets stomach full, he is going to stop refusing. He is going to start spitting. He's going to start saying uh, reaching. He's going to say, I don't want feeds anymore. So in order, because he knows that after doing that, she is going to stuff it further. So I tell the parents, even though you feel that the child is not taken enough, leave the baby. Don't feed him. Don't force him. Don't force. Just leave it. Even if the child has half the food, it's okay. If you leave it for about three, four days, the child will have confidence that you're not going to force. Tell it will be all right and vomiting will stop. Come and see me after one week. As a mark, I say check your child's weight every day. 90% or 95% of the times when they come back, they are quite happy and they continue. But anyway, this is uh, off the cuff. Uh, what is very, very important is that the way you said, I think we are under investigating many of them. Because uh, we do get a lot of patients with swallowing difficulties, especially in our NICU and PSU settings and maybe in the OPD where the child is vomiting. Many times we feel that the pediatricians are washing their hands off by just by referring to them. We evaluate. Most common tendency is to see if there is a surgical cause evident or not. If we feel that there is no surgical cause, no bilious vomiting, no failure to thrive, we generally tend to shoot them off saying, no, 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 that's a, don't be feed and got it back. But I think what you have highlighted is a brilliant one. I think we as a unit uh, should start investigating more. I can see Narendra Babu there and Vinay and a lot of other people. Can you also pitch in and say uh, what do you feel about it? I think, sir, I think, I think uh, on the merit of the case, every case has to be investigated. Yes. So, depending on what symptoms and if there is any associated neurological symptoms, yes, it has to be definitely investigated. There is no shortcut to any definite treatment without proper investigation. Agreed. So, maybe so, there was a grammar part. Yeah. Maybe people did not know how to do it. Now that, uh, rather, they knew how to do it, but it has to cumbersome. And maybe now that you have spoken, it's uh, an eye-opener. Now, what uh, I realize, it's a very patient uh, job, basically. Because it's like our urodynamics, you know. No, it's it, like it, it, it is on the face of it, it looks that, okay, we know the results and it will be great. 
but doing it is a very painful process so unless someone is really committed it's difficult to do it on a regular basis but i guess somebody has to take it up and uh, anyway it's open for discussions please post graduates yeah. and i can see a lot of other consultants yeah. seniors yeah. outsiders please sir uh, uh, ravi kiran here just one uh, thing one point yes please go ahead. Ah. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, regard, this is not uh, specifically to this barium uh, evaluation. It is just for this all radiological procedures. Uh, during our residency itself, all pediatric surgeons are trained to do these procedures, MCU or uh, barium and other things. But in our corporate setting, we have seen that the reports are signed off by radiologists. Yes. So recently, what is happening is a lot of uh, parents are questioning that you are doing the test, but there is some other doctor's name there and some medical legal issues are being raised. So now, do you people, uh, when you do these studies, uh, do you keep a radiologist uh, next to you to sort this out? Because we know that we are better in these procedures than them, but the reports are being signed off by them. So we are nowhere in the picture in the report. So what's your take Sorry, on that? Answer, please. My take should be like, if we look at my colleague, Dr. Vedat, he does his MCOGs directly and he reports it. And yes. I think that, uh, medical legal law tells that if you are competent enough to do a procedure and handle the complications and the consequences of the procedure, then you are legally competent to do the procedure. I think we as a unit, as a pediatric surgery, as a greater platform should take it up and create more awareness that these procedures are ours and reporting and signing authority should be us. There is nowhere in the Indian law it is written that it will be done by the radiologist. It is not a radiologist procedure, so I leave it completely on the senior forum to decide about it and take it up and create an awareness that these procedures are primarily done by pediatric surgeons and their domain. I am seeing many of radiologists pitching in and doing the procedure and then calling me and telling that, can you just discuss the finding with me and see what it is. So ultimately they land up on us to, before releasing the report. But I agree with Dr. Ravi Kiran that majority of the time, the reports are being signed off by the radiologist solely because we also think that medical legally it is a radiological procedure and be, should be reported by the radiologist. Whereas they have no clue about the findings. If I look at the radiologist doing a VFSS, they will not comment on the oral phase, oropharyngeal phase. Only thing they will comment on whether there is a uh, aspiration, there is an aspiration, whether there is uh, a reflux. They have no concept of yo yo movement in the esophagus or the laryngopharyngeal reflux at the tertiary esophageal contractions. I have seen three reports of laryngopharyngeal reflux being reported as the achalasia cardia, which started on the PPI and prokinetics and improved over a period of one and a half to three months. Yeah. To add that, uh, a lot of people I can see, uh, I don't know what others are doing, but let me tell you very clearly, that is all the places that I do the period, I mean, any of these tests, I take responsibility because I am very clear, because it's being done by a clinician, who knows what to do, what to do, how to interpret and how to manage. I do the procedure, I take responsibility and I give the report on my letterhead and send it to them. It should be that way. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't allow the radiologist to do at all. Luckily, most of the places have got a good rapport with all the radiologists and you know, every corporate hospital or private nursing home setup that I go, I have always done it myself or if I give it to them completely, I give it to them. For example, not the fees part of it. But some places where I trust a radiologist well, for example, Praveen is a good friend of mine, over a period of time, we know how well he can report, I give it to him to do. But when I give it to him, he does it. But I don't, at ever any stage, which I do, I don't read the radiologist sign. That is my practice. But I can see Ramchandra, Anil, Narendra Babu, uh, Rajendra Sauji, a lot of other people. Uh, I mean, how do, how do you handle it? Okay, okay. Um, uh, you have brought out really very, very uh, important points, uh, Ramesh. Yes. Uh, I also have a benefit of working in a corporate type of a setup and a public hospital like medical college. Uh, and entirely it is different. First, uh, I will talk about uh, sometimes uh, a very over exaggerated or feeding difficulties. Uh, with which these corporate uh, babies, they not necessarily every time would be chubby, uh, but a lot of irritability, feeding difficulties, both the parents working, etc. those issues are there. And exactly what you are talking about, in addition to that, I have added that I generally request them, if you have got either dadi or nani, if you can get at home and leave it to her. 
our yes. traditional uh, things are so good they slowly trained the new mother uh, in a best possible way and the child or the baby uh, also responds in a um, very good way without much of medication much of evaluation etc and of course you keep them in follow up the second group of such uh, wealthy patients they come our nri uh, group of patients where uh, in the western world particularly united states i have seen at the drop of head started feeding but gastrostomy uh, then once they come here in a vacation or this uh, it is difficult whether to take out that gastrostomy or what and all sort of diagnostic uh, big names particularly acronyms are given for various swallowing disorders again after careful assessing and discussing with them and analyzing that in the traditional system all family particularly near grandmother is involved in the care and the young mother which learns from her and the child baby gets a very good confidence and uh, and the sort of environment uh, where swallowing uh, act can be uh, sort of developed uh, very well these are two issues third point i have seen uh, all these babies those who have really got a problem in the newborn or early infancy it is very difficult to make out uh, all these subtle hypoxic events which have occurred or other issues and over a period of time uh, they come out they are usually actually in the state of incipient cerebral palsy or thing when they become around 1 year of age or little more uh, the problem of uh, the cerebral palsy and all uh, comes to the fore Uh, these are three important points. The question which I would like to ask Dr. Shavana, who has done a very brilliant job of presentation, which type of water soluble contrast you use? Usually, uh, we use any non, I mean, iodinated contrast material. Like uh, to be very often, we are using the uh, Omnipack or Urographin, which is more or less okay for us to do this study. no but urographin is a very uh, osmolar type hydrophobic so we keep the this thing so 1 is to 5 dilution if you increase the dilution i mean make it more concentrated 1 is to 3 years things things becomes very sticky so if it becomes very sticky it is very difficult for the child to swallow no, so but the gastrographin is available not rasagastro and uh, gastrographin is not very palatable sir for the children in my personal experience If can you add a little glycerin or something to make it a little more tasty? No, sir. It it comes with a pungent smell. Okay. The moment you bring it in front of their mouth, no, they just turn okay. their face. Whereas no, if you look at the Omnipack or the Urographin, I found it very. Uh, what should I say? The smell is not that bad. So the majority of the time, I use Omnipack. But sometimes, if I have any issues with the visibility or I need it little more uh, contrast efficient. I add little bit of urography. Yeah, what about the thing barium itself? Barium yeah, exactly. aspiration, uh, we had trouble because this ch- children lands up with severe pneumonitis and ventilated. Uh, Doctor Shauna, my I... Doctor Shauna. Yes, I am listening. Yeah, yeah. My my understanding of this is uh, barium is very irritative to the peritoneum and relatively harmless to the lungs and uh, water soluble contrasts are vice versa. That's why yeah. we when we do a suspected anastomotic leak in the abdomen, we use water soluble and not barium. Whereas when we do swallowing studies where risk of aspiration, we do mm-hmm. barium. Relatively, it is better. That is my understanding. So not just the, the an extension, Ravi. As yeah. an extension, I don't know. I mean, you are also expo. You are from Wadia, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Nathkarni was there as a radiologist uh, during your time. It is my uh, time. She used to be there. She used to do. Ams those days, okay. okay. Putting uh, contrast in the bronchus to check the bronchial tree, okay. Where bronchoscopy mm-hmm. is not so easily. Sometimes we used to do it for bronchitis. <coughs> She used to use sterile barium, mm-hmm. okay. So yeah. to indicate that barium is not bad. If yes, you can sir, dilute right. it, sterilize it. And in fact, Ravi Ramakantan from KEM also used to use that. So we right. used quite a bit. Uh, Shauna, before I forget, Ram- Ramesh, so why don't you I, just switch on your video? Somebody? One second, Ramesh? Shauna. One second, Shauna. Why don't you switch on your video and? Uh, Stop your screen share. Let me see your face. Yeah, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, no, video uh, will be a little difficult AMC because my webcam is not working. No, in barium we used to use uh, for for quite a few follow studies, but we saw a lot of follow yeah. patients from previous years, and the patients who have had an aspiration, 
the barium just forms a cast it stays in the system almost permanently it just the x ray taken years later still shows the coating and there is uh, changes in the <clears throat> mucosa on the bronchoscopy which whereas i think the water soluble even if it aspirates the i agree that it is the osmolality is higher because it's water soluble i think the body is able to handle it better and to chuck it out the child will be able to cough it out whereas the barium just coats and stays as a cast i've seen beautiful bronchial casts in living children with that having said that uh, congrats uh, dada very very comprehensive job my message to the youngsters who are listening the pgs is like this there are niche areas within pediatric surgery and pediatric urology which not many people are are well versed in find something like this for yourself and become excellent at it so that you know people from all over will search you out even for that small thing and the, your name should come to people's mind when there's a difficult thing so don't just go after the the low hanging fruit uh, which is the common things also keep your eyes out for the the the, the rare things which are there which are difficult to do well done dada uh open for discussion i think anil was trying to say something anil sir no no sir two points one is uh, what dr pikaran has uh, made the point usually for the upper ga we use the thin barium uh, because of the chemical pneumonitis which can cause uh, uh, the ionic uh, uh, contrast can cause so other thing was i was uh, trying to tell about the reporting one is i tell the patient that uh, i am only going to do the procedure i am a pediatric surgeon and uh, i report myself and at the end i'll write the disclaimer this uh, procedure is done and reported by a pediatric surgeon okay and good okay uh, some some kirik patient i'll tell them if you want to take an opinion you can free to take an opinion from the radiologist too and the good second okay. point made by shona case see some of the uh, procedures no sir we have to do, see the dynamic uh, uh, pictures to uh, report it otherwise commonest uh, mistakes we come across is the pu walls see the most of the radiologists may not do the procedure so they try to report the static films so because the external sphincter contraction they report it as a pu walls so i insist on all our radiological procedure has to be viewed dynamic to report it sir thank sure. you sir sure. uh ramchandra vinay morali the staff and then the pgs if you have whatever questions please Uh, Ramesh, uh, yes, sir. Ramesh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Thank you for getting Shaunak uh, to talk about this rare topic. Very well done, uh, Shaunak. You have presented you, a very, uh, very nice uh, way. You have presented it, and it was it was very important that uh, we get exposed to this thing. And uh, you have rightly uh, acknowledged the contribution by the Cincinnati group, which has done a lot of work in this area. Uh, started by Dr. Cotton, and then uh, he developed that uh, airway disease center, and then it uh, sort of morphed into the aero digestive. Now it has become the aero digestive swallowing and esophageal disorder center, and this is a huge uh, setup there in Cincinnati. And as Dr. Robert pointed out, that is the way we should go. Like you know, we should uh, chase after these orphan uh, problems, and uh, sort of accumulate uh, experience in that, highlight the issues. and uh, try to get more and more work into our domain and try to help these patients basically our idea is to help these patients who are sort of let out in society without anything being done to them and very often that reduces their life span and also their uh, lifestyle will be very very badly impaired so you have done a very good job so thank you very much congratulations uh, any other questions or suggestions from anybody the post graduates particularly because i think uh, they are the ones who are reading and they should be getting inspired sir uh, generally in our hospitals uh, we get uh, neonates most commonly yes. so when we try to uh, give when we start uh, give them the feed most of the times they spit sir at 50% of them take very nicely 50% of them spit so how could we improve or uh, how, how could we make ch- children swallow it more sir in the sense we add some su- uh, sugar something like that or we keep the child npo for 2 hours and then we bring the child for fluoroscopy and give some sugar along with the urography how could we improve it better sir yeah so this is the point i was highlighting 
So if you have such history that whether the child is spitting most of the, the thing. Now spitting can be of two things. Either the child is just pursing the lip, lips and just spitting it out or whenever you are trying to give, give the child and the child actually takes the tongue out and spits it out. So that is basically the child is not squeezing the tongue against the heart palate. So if some child, whatever feed is given, refuses to uproll the child tongue and then squeeze it against the heart palate, then it's probably some neurological issues are there. Whereas somebody who is basically pursing the lips and just spitting it out and not taking not taking the tongue out, just, just it drools out from the mouth, then probably your neuroaxial axis to start with the hypoglossal nerve is intact. So probably you have to change the feed and see that how the child takes it. Majority of the time, this what you have described, I have seen this, is basically to the children who are given initially the formula feed, later on shifted to the mother's side and the breast milk is being uh, offered, they spits it out because it is less sweeter. Uh, Thank you, Vinay. Yeah, yeah please. So, one question. Please. Please. Uh, recently, our uh, pediatric pulmonologist uh, have made a protocol that almost all cases of wheezing uh, has to undergo a uh, evaluation by barium to rule out uh, GR. So, recently, we have been having clashes saying that I think it's overkill. We are investigating almost every case of wheezing. Uh, what is your take on that? She says right. it's part of protocol, but, no, I but this is what should she should. Uh, what we need to know is that what she is basically emphasizing is basically the the concept which came into the adult practice years back. That is in the years of 2001-2002, when the American College of Chest Physicians realized that many instances of the adult onset asthma is basically extraesophageal manifestations of the GI. Then they extrapolated it and they found a new entity what is called laryngopharyngeal reflux in the adults. When we see at the children, a specific subgroup which suffers from this is basically the children with laryngomalacia who have what is called a laryngopharyngeal reflux where they don't have frequent vomiting or the regurgitations. They basically come to the OPD with chronic nose block or chronic wheezing or chronic cough. Now, laryngopharyngeal reflux is a new entity where the pulmonologists are looking at the very high grade of reflux which is going and hitting into the larynx and causing persistent damage to the laryngeal mucosa and causing the bearing of the sensory nerve endings and the inflammation of the posterior glottis and lot of pulling of secretions. These are the children who do not respond to the uh, this thing. Now, video fluoroscopic swallow study or the contrast swallow may not be a very good study to look at the laryngopharyngeal reflux because laryngopharyngeal reflux is known to have most of the time as a postprandial reflux. Whereas if we look at the radionucleotide scan, which is more sensitive to pick up the laryngopharyngeal reflux than the, that is the postprandial reflux, the reflux and the video fluoroscopic swallow study. Video fluoroscopic swallow study will be complementary to the radionucleotide scan to look at the anatomic look at the anatomical not dilated and if there is any tertiary esophageal contractions or the yo-yo reflux, intraesophageal reflux to contribute to this. So I think there is still a merit of doing the contrast esophagogram for this. And I will still use the barium for the contrast esophagogram, but for swallow, no. It is very difficult to feed this children. Uh, Shana, you've been repeatedly talking about laryngopharyngeal reflux. Can you please highlight a little more? What exactly is the new concept that you're talking about? So laryngopharyngeal reflux is a part of the GR, that is the gastroesophageal reflux, where in the gastroesophageal reflux, if, it's, if we see a child typically, the child comes either with arching of the body or vomiting, or there is some feed coming through the nose. And we know that there is vomiting after feed, we do a contrast swallow, we do, and we find that there is a reflux. Whereas in the laryngopharyngeal reflux, the child might come to the OPD as the all of a sudden having strider or suddenly becoming cyanose or is having persistent wheeze or having chronic nose block or chronic cough. That is all are extraesophageal manifestations of the reflux. It is very easy to describe in the adults because adults can tell that I don't have any heartburn. 
I don't have any vomiting. I don't feel any acid brush in my throat, but I feel a globus kind of thing. I feel something is sitting in my chest. I feel a lot of cough when I eat after a heavy meal. I get a, a bout of wet cough. But in the children, this is what it is, laryngopharyngeal reflux. Can now, you please elaborate uh, about the symptoms again uh, in a child? Symptoms in the extraesophageal manifestations. Extraesophageal like manifestations arching. like the arching, the child might, uh, might have wheezing, the child might have chronic nose block. Uh, even it has been seen that sudden choking. The child is sleeping and then we find what is a part of this that child all of a sudden mother realizes the child has turned blue at night. Okay. It's basically uh, or chronic cough or adult onset asthma or new onset asthma. So that's why the pulmonologists are more and more going into this uh, picture of looking at this. Now this is a new concept and nobody knows how exactly they are going to respond. So at present it is seen that if they have responded to the PPI therapy well and if they have responded to the proton pump inhibitor therapy well, probably they will also do well to the uh, fund application if uh, the symptoms are really severe. But it's still not decided. The consensus is still not found in the treatment of the laryngopharyngeal reflux. Okay. It is here that I've actually wanted the comments from Dr. Narendra Babu also, because uh, his boss, Dr. Jyotsna Kirtane, uh, after her stint at uh, Great Ormond Street with Lewis Pitts, came back and she had a habit of doing a barium for all the cases, a total lot of uh, any patient who comes with pneumonia, she used to do it. Any case of asthma, she used to do it. And that is the time when she used to be insisting on high incidence of reflex being missed. But I don't know what are the follow up. So what is Narendra must have seen it first hand. So what is your opinion, Narendra? No, we used to do this, like say, like uh, what uh, Ravikiran was telling. So the madam used to uh, all wherever there is a atypical visas without, without any like say seasonal uh, without any season. Uh, okay. The atypical visa, all the atypical visas, we used to subject them for GA study. I personally used to do, we used to do around 10 GA studies every week. Okay. So, the, like, um, say, the pickup rate was around uh, around 20% or 15% of them used to have GA. Uh, not typically, like, say, where we are documented where GA has caused an aspiration on the table. That situations are very less. Those days we never used to do, uh, like, say, the, our uh, nuclear uh, GR study, like uh, milk, milk scans. Okay. So we used to do uh, like uh, barium swallows. In the barium, uh, many of them uh, we are not uh, one or two patients, except uh, uh, we are not seeing the patients aspirating on the table. But uh, uh, we are not seeing that barium going into the, the lungs and all those things. But they used to have significant number of patients used to have GER, and most of them will be managed with the anti GR medications. And some of them is to come for a uh, say surgery. So, but yes, it is to pick up some cases. But I, I would yeah. say it was uh, too many radiology procedures for a patients, uh, okay. uh, which were not we are not able to pick up that many number of GS. Uh, other school of thought was so the question is for Shonak. Like yeah. uh, when uh, yeah, uh, Shonak, uh, uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, I uh, I missed the initial part, but uh, my question is. Uh, the, when you want uh, the endoscopic uh, functional endoscopic swallowing evaluation, uh, apart from this, uh, this uh, standard videoscopic uh, swallowing evaluation, so basically the advantage of the this has got a very good uh, evaluation for the pharyngeal phase of the reflux. Suppose if you are doing a, as I told in the beginning, that video fluoroscopic swallow study and teeth should be complementary to each other. If you have seen during the phase, the child is taking the feed, yeah, yeah, and then pushes it with the tongue back into the pharynx and then you have a minute degree of aspiration and then it go, goes down into the uh, esophagus. Then you have some doubt of the pharyngeal coordination of the child. Now you don't want to give a very high volume of feed to the child or uh, cause, uh, take a risk of aspiration. What is the advantage of the uh, piece is that you use a just colored feed, there is no contrast That's material in, in huh, colored feed, green colored feed or pink colored feed. Green is good actually, it has a good contrast with the mucosa. And then you give a very small amount of bolus into the, uh, over the tongue and see how the child handles the pharyngeal phase. When you are putting the endoscope before giving the feed, you yourself will know if there is any pulling of the secretions in the hypopharynx, is there any inflammation of the posterior glottis, is there the whole hypopharyngeal pharyngeal area is looking normal or looking very inflamed. Then you know that some degree of 
reflux is happening or there is some degree of postnatal drip whatever may be the cause which is causing a chronic irritation of the that particular area and that time if you give the feed and child is able to swallow in spite of all these things then you have a reduction that if you treat this laryngopharyngeal reflux if you treat this child for the extraesophageal manifestations of the GA, probably things will improve much better for this child. If somebody no, is not, not able to handle the oral phase of swallowing itself, where you are giving, yeah. giving the food and the child is not rolling and pushing it against the this thing, pharyngeal, yes, then very unlikely that the volunt involuntary phase that a pharyngeal laryngeal coordination is going to give you any greater information. So, whenever you suspect uh, there is some aspiration, pharyngolaryngeal uh, incoordination, particularly yeah. the pharyngolaryngeal incoordination may not be aspiration. Sometimes the child okay. is doing kuruk kuruk, you are not seeing any aspiration into that. You are having some pulling of the uh, uh, this thing, feeding into the pharynx. You can still consider to do a feast to look at the particular direct visual, real time direct visualization of the pharyngolaryngeal coordination with the feed, feed bolus. Yeah. True. Uh, cutting to what Narendra was saying earlier, um, the other school of thought when they actually did a lot of these bariums in the beginning for all cases of wheezers and again choosing them, uh, at least the atypical ones and not responding ones, at least they used to make a small subset of patients with asthma and of course in Bangalore it's much more, uh, where the yield was actually not as much as what they expected. So the other treatment what they used to do was at least to, uh, the subsector where they thought could be GER, they used to treat them with uh, actively with the PPA and other things and see if they respond, it is good. If not, they used to do a testing. Uh, it's a very acceptable way of treating, sir, because majority yeah. of the time the child will be crying or uncomfortable. We really do not know the reflux which is happening with the VFSS is actually yeah. a physiological reflux or not. Okay. Uh, next thing I wanted to ask Shonok was, what is your take on this uh, nuclear studies? Because I feel that uh, nuclear studies is oversensitive and gives a lot of false positives. So, so there is good body of evidence to tell that uh, nuclear scan is good for to pick up the postprandial reflux and the lung aspiration. Okay. Per se, in an empty stomach, doing a uh, this one uh, thing is not. Suppose if you can get an older child who will cooperate with the feeding. Okay. You can give a good volume of feed to the child to feed and then look at the nuclear scan, then the postprandial aspirations, which we may miss on the video fluoroscopic swallow study. Sometimes these silent aspirations are not picked up. Okay. The sensitivity might be poor. Then those cases, yes, it has got some degree of this thing. But again, the anatomical integrity will not be known for the esophagus. How is the lower esophagus being there? How is the lower esophagus, whether it is dilatable, I mean dilated or not, we will not know from this study. Uh, just to uh, 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 extrapolate what you're saying, it is not just about the doing a test, but also how do they do it. I still remember Dr. Josna Ketane keep telling about it that there are two ways to do a nuclear scan. One is to let the child swallow and see what is the reflux going on to the uh, lungs and how much is going to the stomach and what is the gastric emptying time on a nuclear scan. But this requires a lot of patience, a lot of gamma camera time, which most of the uh, isotope scan centers can't afford to give. So the other alternative is to put in a raised tube, feed the child with a physiologic amount of the stomach capacity of a, ra a radioisotope tagged material, pull out the raised tube and check for the presence of uh, uh, high grade reflux in the uh, uh, lung fields. That I thought was uh, much more sensible, but to do that is difficult because most of the whether Bangalore Institute of Oncology or New Med that we send, they just give a little swallow, see if it's there and just say it is yes, it is seen in the is a Vegas not knowing whether it is a prograde going or retrograde coming back. No, that's uh, what is your take important. They have the history that how much the child is taking. Yeah. And what is the amount of the mother will tell. If I give 60 ml, the, he is very comfortable. The moment I increase it to 80 ml, he is very uncomfortable. He just uh, wriggles around. So those history takings are very important to do the swallow. The problem is that this, they really do not have much time to do all yes. these things. If they take the history and do the swallow properly, probably they can do it in sequential phase when the mother is telling comfortable, not comfortable, like that. Okay. But in general, broadly, nuclear scan has a good pickup sensitivity. I will not say specificity for the postprandial mm -hmm. reflux and the silent aspirations. Okay. Uh, any other questions or suggestions? Uh, please, please, please. I'm waiting for others. Every everybody. 
the point which uh, we were discussing right now was uh, about the nuclear scan it has additional benefit of differentiating the aspiration which is appearing into the airway whether it is from the lower end or from the upper end what i mean by that is that the problem is at the laryngopharyngeal level or uh, which is coming from the upper story uh, neurological disorder this is one group that is upper group and the lower group is uh, lower like achalasia gastroesophageal reflux and other things so if you do or if you see positive presence of tracer activity in the lung in the early phase it indicate that you are dealing with problem of the upper type of uh, issues of aspiration whereas if you don't see that and if you see later on after few minutes uh, or hours uh, it is indicative of lower uh, structural uh, type of problem so that way also it helps in differentiating Uh, between upper and lower sites of aspiration probably and accordingly then you can focus more while doing all these uh, fees and uh, um, endoscopic evaluation of the airway uh, second point which i thought i would uh, this highlight uh, this uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux or cricopharyngeal reflux are very closely related if you do uh, this study yourself and see while doing it on uh, uh, image intensifier you will see a nice up and down dancing movement of the contrast material from pharynx to uh, from hypopharynx or upper esophagus or cricopharynx region to the nasopharynx uh, that indicate that you are dealing with uh, cricopharyngeal incoordination and the therapeutic implication of this is that uh, while doing endoscopic evaluation you can just do a nice forceful dilatation of the cricopharynx and there is dramatic improvement in some babies or those babies who improve initially put on weight their lung become clear because swallowing improves and over a period of time they again develop this so maybe couple of times you can dilate this and then over a period of time you will come to know you are dealing with the incipient stage of cerebral palsy or any neurological issue so that way it has got therapeutic implications also thank you thank you raju uh, any other questions or suggestion from pg is more than anything anybody else if there's nothing else um, ramesh at one time there was an entity called as uh, which uh, dr raju uh, alluded to which was called as uh, cricopharyngeal achalasia yes there sir. was an entity like that and okay. uh, japanese uh, uh, pediatric surgeons were very uh, fond of that and there have been uh, series uh, published where they have done uh, uh, cricopharyngeal myotomy and they have demonstrated improvement in uh, the swallowing and other symptoms and also aspirational events in these uh, aspiration events in these uh, patients with this swallowing disorder and okay. uh, as uh, raju suggested uh, the uh, nuclear medicine is an important uh, investigation which uh, sort of uh, collaborates other investigation and when i was working in the us uh, uh, the surgeon will not get money for uh, doing a fund of placation unless it has been Uh, uh certified by the gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist will not certify unless a nuclear study has been done so that's where the uh, you know thing uh, rolls everything goes according to how uh, the standard of care situation the pathway is established but right now i think and i feel uh, it is i feel it is important nuclear medicine uh, is important when you take important decisions like doing surgical procedures and all that but i think that is now replaced with ph probe sir because uh, when i was there whatever stint i was there in us i was I used to ask you jackson about when do you do he used to say simply like the way you said when the gastroenterologist asked me to do as when does no, the no, gastroenterologist no, no. The ph probe do? ph probe is important yeah. for uh, reflux okay but to tell you whether gastric emptying time is normal or not there is no okay. other study other than nuclear medicine okay so uh, gastric emptying time has to be established before you do only fund application otherwise you have to do a fund application and a pyloric procedure if you want to uh, treat these children okay um, any other questions if there's nothing else uh, a few uh, comments before we wind up one um, a brilliant talk and i think sometime we need to also discuss about the slow transit constipation a lot of studies are talking about this defecogram and uh, 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 constipation studies where uh, uh, shonak any suggestions or ideas that you are doing this No, we are not do doing. We tend it, to sir. see a lot of these constipations in your practice. Yes, yes, we tend to see. But uh, at present, uh, to be very honest, habitual constipations majority of the time we are managing the medically, not not doing defecogram or anything. Very refractory okay. ones. Very rarely I have done the contrast animal study. Okay. 
um i'm sorry i just missed out the elena non academic profile academic profile of course he finished his uh, 6 dnb course from narayana hrudaya and sanjay rao and ashley and then i think uh, uh, little stints here and there and but he is really blossomed into a great surgeon and a, a good technician under uh, dr robert thank you very much for both of them for encouraging him to become to what it is of course he is our student also to that extent that uh, he did his uh, uh, what do you call training in uh, laparoscopy and ras quite some time back and i am sure he is doing a lot of procedures both open and laparoscopy these days but what is more important than the academic is the non academic side of uh, uh, shonak just like the internet has got a good side and the dark net uh, he is very very active on the the good aspects of the dark net okay let me put it this way so if you have any articles to be taken any say, textbooks to be taken academic references i think he has already given two presentations to us earlier about how to crack and i think all this kai hub and other things which many of us use actually have originated from him